Welcome to another Yaron Debates Europe. So Yaron is back from a hiatus of something like three weeks, and this week he's actually going to debate in Europe. So today he's debating conservative commentator and activist. I'm in Darren. Asia, Nikos. I'm in Asia. Well, then why is Israel in EuroLeague and in Champions League? I, come on, I think it's because Europe. the Asians won't play Israel because of the Arab boycott. Oh, and Israel is based on my anybody's study of geography in Asia. I mean, you, you got to look at a map sometime, Nikos. And given that you're from Greece, you should know this. Yeah, but you took away my punchline, which would be that on Saturday, you'll literally be with us in London, where Yaron is going to have his first face-to-face -face event, I, probably in two years in the UK, but more on that later. So today, Yaron's sparring debating partner is Darren Grimes. So Darren is, as I said, the conservative commentator and activist. He's one of the people who have gotten into so much trouble for his views. His, I think, Darren, even the police has been after you for one, for more, in more than one occasion. So it tells you something about the culture and the political atmosphere in this country. So our topic today is conservatism. So... The, the, the title is conservatism, good or bad, but actually the topic, the thing that we're mostly interested in is, is conservatism fit for the purpose of defending freedom? And is conservative fit for the purpose of stopping what most of us understand as a problem, a decline in the ideas and the culture in the West? So you, for those of you who haven't been with us, the format is, Darren's going to start with his introductory remarks. Then we're going to go to Yaron. And then you, the audience, can ask questions via Super Chat. And this is how it's going to be. So a big thank you, as usual, to the Ayn Rand Institute for sponsoring this event. A big thank you to Darren for being with us. So, Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, obviously, a very big thank you to the Ayn Rand Centre here in the UK for the invitation. I am someone who, it might, it might shock you to learn this, but I am someone who might have considered himself more on the sort of libertarian side of things at one point in my political journey. And I certainly think that Rand's work is worth exploring. So I'm sure this is going to make for a very interesting discussion this evening. Now, I'm going to start by saying something that I think many objectivists would actually agree with. And I'll probably receive a standing ovation at this point, and then we can just pack up and leave and have gin and tonics or something like that. We conservatives, we aren't actually that clever. Now, what I mean by that is that many of us don't have degrees. Many of us voted for Brexit, God forbid. Many of us quite like our queen and our country. We, there are various character traits or, or indeed flaws that many amongst the sort of uneducated elite would turn their noses up at. And I guess I'm one of them. And I'm not for a second going to suggest that I'm the most educated man in this room. I, I was going to say room, virtual room this evening. But here we go. I will do my best to make a case for conservatism, or at least as the late and great Sir Roger Scruton once called it, the philosophy of love, which is a line I like a lot. Now, I was thinking about the question, conservatism, good or bad today? And I think it's essential to actually define what we mean by conservatism, because I imagine this is where we're going to have some disagreements. Uh, first of all, I, I, I don't think it's fair to dismiss conservatism as being some kind of reactionary dismissal of anything to do with change, right? A sort of self-described conservative doesn't hiss like a cat that's just had its tail stood on at the changing of, I don't know, a battery pack or something, because we quite like the old batteries that powered our television remote better. And I think on conservatism more fundamentally and focusing more on, on Rand in particular, Rand was quoted as saying that there's nothing left to conserve because basically the status quo is now all, you know, collectivism. I actually don't accept that there's nothing left to con conserve. I actually think there's an awful lot left to conserve and God help us in doing so. Because we humans, I think, naturally have an instinct to preserve that which we love which we respect, which we cherish from the past and care for the familiar, of course, as well. Mistrust and change for change's sake. And I think modern conservatism that does believe in a market economy that can point to all of the evidence looking back 
on private property and markets that have generally produced, I think, prosperity and preserved freedom and make a case indeed for the state to actually have an albeit limited role in ensuring law and order and protecting individuals in their privacy and activities against things like fraud and theft and all these other things. But I think where I potentially will continue to diverge uh, from your aunt is my view that community shared identity in this country, of course, I'm not suggesting we should do that in America, but monarchy and institutions like it are crucial. They're as crucial to me as pound and pence or dollar and nickels. And I think that liberalism is experiencing here in place an economic growth above all else, as it has done for years and years now, as the best route to sort of grow the economic pie that we all enjoy so we can spend more money on all the things that we all like. I think there was this sort of shrug your shoulders like acceptance that, oh, it'll all be fine. You know, pro-market conservatism bet on the sort of persistence of moral values to act as a almost a bulwark against the disruption of an ever-changing market economy. But I'm, I'm afraid that it simply hasn't followed through like that. There's been a hollowing out of many of communities. And I think the, the sort of loss of faith has been corrosive for shared values, morality, um, society and the institutions that I just mentioned earlier. I think I look around communities like this one, for example, and I very much feel the effects of that for your own. This is quite a working class area in the northeast of England. And I think here and in the United States, we're constantly asking these existential questions about who we are and what our values are. And we wouldn't actually, I, I think it, it's probably fair to say, that we are at each other's throats at the minute, like you wouldn't believe. You know, try, but you mentioned in your opening, very kind opening remarks there, that I've been in, under investigation by the police. Yes, vexatious political people who don't like your political speech, they'll come for you with vexatious claims to police officers. They'll come for you through the law. They'll come for you in whatever way they can. They'll try and have you lose your job through your employer and things like that. I think we're living through, despite peaceful and tolerant times in across the West. We're sliding in with a sort of civilization under threat, in my view. There are movements to pull down statues, to destroy those we disagree with, as I say, to assume that 14 million Conservative Party voters or 17.4 million Brexit voters are inherently wicked because you disagree with their democratic decision. These sort of things suggest to me that we've never needed to look back more to actually take the steps and leap forward. And that's why I think conservatism has to act as that bulwark, as I mentioned, against those who just want to sort of destroy rather than build or protect. You know, it's the same sort of policy platform, the same looking back, that retrospective approach that actually enabled us to resist the arguments of, I don't know, the French Revolution or Oswald Mosley and his British Union of Fascists or Maoism and even, thanks be to God, Jeremy Corbynism. Thank God for that. <laughs> because political conservatism, I think, is here ultimately to conserve a process uh, well, well, yeah, a process of change, not an outcome, right? It's a sort of steady as she goes. Are we sure we want to do this? No, but, you know, really, guys, let's think about this. And I think if, if well, if only the UK Conservative Party agreed with me on all of that, then it wouldn't perhaps, and I think we will agree on this, they wouldn't put forward asphyxiating net zero targets, sort of arbitrary targets of achieving net zero by 2050 in the name of environmentalism. Um, I think conservatism has to actually be a little bit more robust than it is being currently. I think it's right to be cautious. I think it's right to not be as exciting as billboards with clenched fists reading the word resist. You know, we're not as exciting as that on the conservative side of the argument. If I had a billboard right now, it would probably just read steady, which is slightly boring, I will admit. But my God, I think it's necessary at this juncture. And I think there's actually a lot that especially with the proposition, there's a lot that objectivists and conservatives should be agreed on, right? We should be agreed that the divides as far as free speech is concerned and in learning the lessons of our past are important as far as speech and debates concerned, as far as those fundamental questions of the, the cancel culture that we're experiencing across the West. 
I think where we'll potentially diverge again is that view that my view that a, a sort of meaningful life must entail necessary prerequisites of community, personal morality. I think a sense of a higher purpose or mission and care for others has have got to come into it. And I guess I hark back to to someone like Adam Smith, you know, a, a, the father, as you were, maybe even the grandfather at this point, great, great grandfather, who knows, of the sort of modern market economy, who was equally interested in morality as I am, I think, you know, he reckoned that you, you could only sustain it by a sense of responsibility. Then you've got the likes of Edmund Burke saying that our, uh, actually liberty is fantastic, you know, absolutely my cup of tea, but it only makes sense when it's coupled with moral and accountable individuals. And I think liberalism, my concern is that liberalism and those values reflected in the Enlightenment and ultimately enshrined in that most important of constitutions, the American Constitution, can only exist really when married with the kind of values that we once had to fix the sort of God-shaped hole in our lives and, and look to be increasingly, I guess, common in, in liberal societies that we've, we've been hollowed out in that sense. And I think with a rush to fill that hole with the kind of activism of, of radical movements, to, to find something bigger than yourself, I think there's a real crisis of belonging across the West. You know, you've got groups like Black Lives Matter, you've got Extinction Rebellion, you've even got Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. You know, there ought to have been, I think, a recognition that there has been in communities up and down the UK for the, this idea that actually it's quite important to remember home and place for the rule of law, for places that place the country as its icon. And I, I don't, I, or rather I do doubt at this point that they'll, you know, there won't be a little bit of eye rolling from the, any of the objectivists watching right now. But I think it's essential to, to make that case and, and put that forward, especially post-Brexit in a post-Trump world, Your Honour, I don't mean to trigger you with the use of Trump's name, but in which we conservatives are sort of dismissed with some ism or some phobia. You know, if I say I espouse, I believe in Brexit, they say, well, you're clearly racist. You're clearly all of the, if you believe in biological sex, you're clearly transphobic. Those sort of things I think are where there, there should be agreement with objectivism. And I think I would robustly argue that there can be no more valiant a case than, and I think Ayn Rand potentially herself explicitly said that it's you know, rationally selfish to be willing to die for, for your freedom because of the importance of living in, uh, as opposed to being, you know, a slave, essentially. And I think there is that tension between conservatives and those interested in getting to know things and, and those who want to change things. I think the former, getting to know things, helps you look back at the past and see what's been helpful and what's been valuable and the best route forward in defending freedom. That's what I would urge everyone to do right now. You know, an example would be how we've taken for granted the role of language and gendered terms for men and women. Gone are such things. And with it, by the way, we see today in the UK press, there are stories about how male-born sex offenders who identify as women can be treated on female-only NHS wards, or male-born weightlifters can compete with women at the Olympics on a playing field that's certainly anything but level. And I think looking back through history, you'd have to, you'd be, it would be difficult to not, I think, come away with an almost jealous stance on guarding our language and, and beautiful as it is because of the way in which we've come to, to, as a society, build ourselves around this language. These people are trying to fundamentally alter society through words, in my opinion. So yes, conservatism, I think, is indeed the right choice for defending freedom, in my opinion. It might not have slogans as exciting as, I don't know, give me liberty or give me death, or, you know, of resisting capitalism, but my God, in an age of unreason, in an age when I think we could do with a little more reasoning, it's record, that record of conservatism throughout history, I think is infinitely better than that of the visionaries who have sought perfection here on earth. Thanks a lot, Darren. And uh, that was a passionate defense of conservatism, which is unusual because the usual line these days is, well, we're better than the left, but 
I appreciate uh, appreciate your your point. So a reminder to our friends that you can send your questions to either Darren or Yaron or both via super chat. Now we're gonna go to Yaron's reply, and then we're gonna go to the Q and A. Yaron, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, thank you, Darren, for agreeing to do this. I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, I mean, we're gonna agree on much of the state of modern culture. Uh, you know, you're not. I'm not gonna defend the nutcases on the left and 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 the state of uh, of the culture, the state of morality, the state of um, uh, the debate that exists today. Uh, I would just argue that much of it is the fault of conservatives. That is, uh, I think that this is the world conservatives to a large degree have helped create. Mm. You're the guys who've been around. Indeed, you're the guys who've been in political power for much of this period. You certainly have been the guys who have been the nominal defenders of free markets on that side of the spectrum. Uh, over the last 50, 100 years, and this is the world which we have. And, and I don't think that's an accident. I, I, I think, I think it, it is because of the nature of the way in which conservatives try to protect freedom, free speech, uh, capitalism, free markets, that has left this massive opening for the left to do what it has done uh, and has acted to destroy, um, uh, to destroy this world. I, I mean, you, you ended with, you know, conservatives, steady, we don't need these radicals. But yes, you do. I mean, at the end of the day, it was radicals that created the United States of America that, that launched the revolution um, and, and advocated for those radical ideas of the Enlightenment and, and created, okay, the second best country in all of human history. But, you know, uh, I would argue the, first, the, the greatest country in human history but, but suddenly took the best ideas coming out of England and Scotland and, 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 and turned them into a country. Mm -hmm. They were radicals. They were revolutionaries in, in the best sense of the word. And to, in a sense, lump revolutionaries in, lump, lump the, the, the American founders and the French revolutionaries into the same pot is a massive mistake. And I know not all conservatives do that. I realize that. Edmund Burke didn't yeah. do that, for example. But... That's what happens when you say we don't need those radicals. Well, you're lumping in some good radicals with bad radicals because you're not looking at what I think are the essentials. Um, and I think what the world needs today is radicals with idealism, um, the, the attraction of the left, the attraction of uh, these crazies is that they have ideals. The ideals from our perspective might be crazy. The ideals are immoral and wrong, but they have ideals. They have something they're willing to fight for. You talked about give me liberty or give me death. Yes, I'm all for give me liberty or give me death. That's an ideal worth fighting for. And worth, as you mentioned, Ayn Rand herself said, it's worth fighting and risking your life for freedom, for liberty. But then you have to define freedom and liberty. And conservatives want to have it both ways. They want to project an image of we're really for freedom and liberty. But when it comes to practical power, which conservatives had, very little movement in that direction, right? Very little movement in that direction, very little consistency. It seems more convenient. Certainly the current conservative government in the UK seems to be all over the place when it comes mm -hmm. to ideas of liberty and freedom. Um, as my attempts to enter the, the UK um, these days are uh, uh, you know, exhibiting, it's, it's very difficult to get in the UK. It's a little easier as of yesterday. It became a little easier. Um, the problem is, and if we if you look deeper, you talk about morality. And look, I traveled around the world talking about the moral case for capitalism. Uh, this it, it's all about morality. The whole debate is about morality. The whole discussion about morality. But unfortunately, I think the conservatives share their morality with the left much more closely than they share morality that is truly about creating the kind of world of liberty and freedom that's that's consistently pro liberty and freedom. Uh, this is, I think, why um, this is, I think, the importance of Ayn Rand. I think Ayn Rand presents us with, yes, a revolution in morality, but a revolution in morality that both uh, displaces left and right, that both displaces the conservatives and the left. Because in the end, both conservatives and the left share a fundamental idea about morality, uh, the fundamental idea of morality being focused on the other, a fundamental idea of 
of morality being about sacrifice and being about giving and being about selflessness versus a morality of virtue, a morality of true, not superficial, which I think it, it, it is true of, of most conservatives where the, the, there's a superficial claim of personal responsibility, but, but not when it gets down to the, to the nitty gritty, as, as we can see how conservative governments have dealt even with COVID. It, you know, personal responsibility is out the window as soon as uh, one can imagine um, uh, some social good being attained by dismissing social responsibility and reducing it. COVID is a good example. Instead of relying on peace post personal responsibility, instead of appealing to people's personal responsibility, immediately mandates, immediately, you know, we know best. We, the conservative philosopher kings, know, you know, just like the left philosopher kings know how you should live. And of course, the right has always been like this. And, and a lot of it is derived from the fact that conservatism, whether modern conservatives like it or not, is linked to religion. And religion is, like it or not, authoritarian in its nature. It's not about reason. That's what the Enlightenment was about. The revolution that is the Enlightenment is about elevating reason, and reason is a characteristic of the individual. Uh, it is about, conservatism is about the way things have been, whether they are reasonable or not, whether they're based on reasonable or not. It's about religion, which is, you know, faith is, is at the end of the day, the opposite of reason. Um, conservatism is about looking at, uh, uh, you know, authorities, rather than leaving individuals free to reason for themselves. And sometimes you won't like the conclusions that they get to. That's what freedom, uh, part of what freedom is about. So I think if we're going to look backwards, and I'm all for looking backwards, because I think we learn from history, and we have to look backwards, and it's important. I don't view that as a conservative point of view. I think we should look back at the, at the, at the errors and at the thinkers that have promoted human flourishing the most. Um, and I would say, we need to look back at Greece and particularly at Aristotle. We need to look backwards at the Enlightenment, uh, particularly the Scottish Enlightenment and the French Enlightenment, uh, which I think share a lot more in common than people often suggest. Um, and we need to take the basic ideas, the fundamental ideas that Aristotle and the Enlightenment share and project them into the future. Um, I don't know that there's a role for the queen in that structure, um, but, but we can resolve that when we get, uh, when we get to that uh, of that particular problem. That should be the last of our worries about whether there should be a queen or not. Um, so it, it, the issue is conserving what? Um, I don't think conservatism is about conserving the Enlightenment. If it was, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be supportive of it. Although even there, uh, the, it's still, any point of view you take still has to be, you have to be able to reason to it. You have to be argue for it. You have to be able to argue for it. You can't just rely on, well, this is how it's been or this is, or look, you know, it just is. Um, it has to be right, and it has to be just, and it has to be moral. So um, I think the big difference is that objectivism fundamentally rejects the epistemology, epistemology of conservatism, because conservatism is not grounded in reason, ultimately. And I think it rejects the morality of, of conservatism, um, which uh, a morality which for objectivism is grounded in self-interest, in rationally long-term view of self-interest, that is what morality is. And conservatism has a conventional morality. It has, it has kind of, uh, at best, Adam Smith view of morality. Um, at worst, uh, much more conventional even than Adam Smith. But remember, Adam Smith viewed self-interest as something that ultimately led to social well-being, not as a good in and of itself. Um, and, and I think, I think he's, he's gravely mistaken in that. I think morality is about um, pursuing the good, your good as an individual in and of itself. I think that's what ultimately leads to healthy communities. That's what he, uh, leads to healthy solidarity, individual respect, respect for oneself, viewing other people in, in the context of trade, in the context of non-zero-sum non game, um, uh, viewing other people as an, uh, is in a sense an asset, not a liability. I think the left is very good at viewing people as a liability. They're a burden, they're a cost. And I think conservatives slip into that way too often because they take a collectivistic status point of view. Um, collective in, and politically, I think conservatism flirts with collectivism. Uh, most of the conservatives, or many of the conservatives I know collectivists, not all of them, 
Now, there are some who, who strive towards individualism. So that would be my, those would be my, uh, my concerns. Um, and, and part of it is expressed with this idea bigger than yourself. I mean, what does that even mean? Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, is, is fighting for freedom, fighting for a cause bigger than yourself? Is it when it's my freedom partially that I'm fighting for and the people I love and the people I care for and the values I've chosen? Um, no, I think that's part of fighting for myself. It's fighting for my own values, for, for me. Um, it's when it really is bigger than yourself, fighting for something that is unseen or unknown, uh, fighting for a country, whether it's good or bad. I can imagine fighting for a good country. I, I've escaped fighting for or, or, or tried to avoid fighting for countries I don't like. Um, so, you know, it's a question of is nationalism really greater than yourself? Well, it depends on the nation. Um, and and you, you try to fight for nations where the fight is not for something bigger than yourself, but for something that's part of you. Um, and that would be a, a good country. So I, I actually think the differences between objectivism and conservatism are quite deep uh, and, 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 and real and not just political, but, but much deeper than that. Thank you, Aaron. So I think there's more value for the audience instead of me managing the discussion at this point. Why don't we let, why don't we give three, four minutes to Darren to reply to your own comments and then Yaron, you reply to Darren's comments and then we go to questions so yeah. that you both have the chance to address the main points of the other side. Darren. Yeah, absolutely fine. I, I would agree, actually, that uh, Boris Johnson or the UK Conservative Party are dashing around like a sort of shopping trolley with a dodgy wheel, right? They, they don't know that, if you don't mind me using a French way of putting it, their arse from their elbow. So I do think they're all over the shop. I completely agree with that. They don't know what they're about. They don't know who they are. And that's a problem. It's a directionless government. And that comes down to everything like the, the, the market economy and defending the, the market economy. So I, I agree on that point. Now, I, I think morality, the, the question of morality in and of itself, it's about a balance between, yes, let's pursue self-interest. I completely agree with Adam Smith and, and every, everyone that has followed on that point. But I think you've got to balance it with, that idea of selflessness that I, I'm afraid I do disagree. And this is where I massively diverge from objectivism, that I don't agree that being entirely selfish and motivated only by self is a good way to, to be, create a cohesive society. I don't think that is born, has been borne out by the way in which liberalism has played out so far. I don't actually think that the policy of the day has been conservatism. I think actually the role of conservatives in government has been to, to actually manage liberalism. And I'm afraid that the conservatives in power, David Cameron, I, Theresa May, all of these people were liberals. I don't actually think they were conservatives in any sense. And that might shock you to, to hear that. But I, all of the, the, the big sort of enlightenment beasts that you mentioned there uh, as well, they were all, I think, crucially, they were all religious figures. And that, I think, comes into to play. And especially, I know you mentioned there, you mentioned Edmund Burke and how he didn't make comparisons between um, the uh, French Revolution and the American Revolution. But I think crucially as well, uh, the, the, there's this idea, the reason why is because there's a recognition of the differences between them. You had the Americans, what seemed like, you know, they really had their crap together, right? They really, really had themselves sorted. And it seemed like they were really going through everything that they'd learned from at the Enlightenment at, on both sides of the pond. And it wasn't as absolutely god awful as as you know there wasn't regicide or anything like that attempted regicide admittedly but it didn't happen thanks be to god um long may she reign but i, I think as well that's another thing that you mentioned there it, about christianity in particular about religion in particular i actually argue that christianity at the heart of christianity is choice Right. I can choose right now if I want to run out there onto that street and rob my next door neighbor. I can choose whether or not I want to help someone down the street. I can choose whether or not I want to hold a door open for somebody or something as, as you know, reductive as that, because religion is about choice. 
in my opinion. So, and, and as well, I think the Conservative Party, the collectivism that you mentioned, I actually, this, this is where I will be, uh, I will speak up for the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom. I think one of the best things that they ever did was put in place universal credit, a sort of reform of the benefit system to create um, the, the plethora of a, a sort of absolutely labyrinth-esque benefit system and reduce it into one single payment, universal credit. And that has actually been transformative as far as it's actually managed to get more people into work and guaranteed, and especially again, I, I come back to the idea of communities like this one, working class communities, where having a father that's in work actually ensures it's statistically proven that you're as a child, you're less likely to end up in doing well, at, better at school. You, you will do better at school if you, your father's at, in work, not in and out of employment. You are less likely to get into drugs and alcohol. There are so many ways in which being employed is a good thing. And the Conservatives have actually encouraged that. So I don't think there perhaps that is a collectivist approach. But I, in my view, it's a laudable one and one to be encouraged within the parameters of a market economy. Um, I, I think it's totally reasonable to, to argue that the, the sort of, uh, I guess, founders of uh, conservatism itself, I'm not sure you can say there's any real founders, conservatism is grounded in reason, I think, but on a sort of rational analysis of what what has been proven to work in the past. I, and I said that throughout my opening remarks there. I think that's the crucial thing. That's the crucial element. That's sort of, yes, it's boring. Yes, it's not as radical as you would like, Yvonne. But there is this idea of, well, before we jump off this cliff, should we first of all check that actually this parachute works? Have we invented that yet? Have we? And I, this is where I disagree with the Conservative Party on net zero, right? There's, we're sort of doing it all on a wing and a prayer, this idea that, Technologies come and charging down the hill at any minute now to, to ensure that we've got energy aplenty and that there won't be any working class people who disproportionately suffer through their livelihoods, through their supermarket bills, through their energy bills, through their uh, precluding them from being able to go on holiday and all of these other things. I'm not convinced that there is that technology just around the corner. There's this sort of Panglossian idea from some conservatives or environmentalists. And the two of those, I think, are merging increasingly. And I, for one, am deeply sceptical about that. So it's that sort of thing where I think perhaps we will agree. I don't, I, maybe I'm wrong on that. But I think any world worldview ultimately, right, that says that the, there's no room whatsoever for thinking about anything other than yourself. I go back to that point that I really worry that that would just create a deeply, deeply unhealthy and miserable society. I mean, I, for one, I don't know about anyone else that's watching this recording, but I, for one, have felt at times incredibly good about myself. The best I've ever felt when I do something for somebody else, it doesn't make me a subservient sort of puppet to somebody. I do it out of my own free will. I use my free will to do something for someone and feel pretty damn good about it. If I contribute to the, the exchequer, I feel good about the fact that I've paid to help pave the roads, all of these other things. You know, if I'm contributing to society, if I feel like I'm part of society, that's about being bigger than you, something bigger than yourself. That's about making room, I think, for other people's needs and not just your own. I think that is where we fundamentally disagree and, and where I ultimately diverged from the philosophy of Miss Rand and her acolytes. Thanks, Dar. Yaron. Yeah, and a few things. Um, I will say, you know, Martin Luther certainly didn't believe you had a choice. So it depends on which Christians you talk to. Uh, Calvin certainly didn't believe you have a choice. So Christianity is, is, is very mixed on this and two of the most important figures in the Protestant Re Reformation believed in predetermination and, and much of the Christian tradition is predetermined. Um, uh, and of course, choice is not unique to Christianity. Uh, choice uh, is all over Greek philosophy. It's all over secular philosophy. You don't need Christianity to recognize the fact that we have choice and we have free will. Um, uh, and, and all our conversations are meaningless. The whole concept of reason is meaningless unless we have that free will and as we have real choices. 
uh, with moral consequences. But let me let me address uh, an economic issue, and then I want to talk about this thinking of self because I think that's important. I mean, one of the great tragedies, I think, is that conservatives have bought into the idea that the working class is suffering because of capitalism. The working class is not suffering because of capitalism. The working class is suffering because of statism. The working class is suffering because state intervention of the economy. Um, that's certainly true in England. It's, I know it's true in the United States, uh, but uh, the, more welfare, uh, the more welfare programs you have, you talked about that labyrinth of welfare programs, the worse the working class is. Uh, the more you regulate business, the more you try to give workers so-called rights, the more you succumb to unions, the worse the working class is. Maybe in the short run, they feel good, but in the long run, their jobs are destroyed. The more you tell workers steel jobs are coming back to America or to England or coal mines, we're going to reopen the coal mines, really, um, it, because we always did coal, the more you're hurting the working class the less you expect working class people to take personal responsibility for themselves, to encourage them to retrain, encourage them to shift professions, encourage them to be personally ambitious. It, it, maybe this is less so in England, but in the United States, this is so certainly true. When conservatives encourage uh, working class people to stay put wherever they happen to be, rather than get in their car and go where their jobs are. And in America, there are regions where their jobs and the regions where they aren't. That is what is causing working class angst. It's leftist policies, not capitalism. One of the problems is that conservatives have bought into the idea that our economic problems today are caused by the market, trade, market, even immigrants, when it's not, none of those are true. The reason we have economic problems in the West today is because of leftist policies, socialist policies, redistribution of wealth, taxation, and massive regulation of business. And you know what, what, what creates jobs for the working class, what makes what allows the working class to increase in the standard of living and quality of life is increased productivity. Increased productivity requires entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship requires economic freedom. It requires low taxation of capital or no taxation of capital, ideally. It requires innovation, it requires progress, it requires economic growth. There is no poverty if we allowed our economies to grow at four to six percent a year, poverty gets wiped out for all intents and purposes within a generation. There are no poor people. I mean, relative poverty will always exist, but there are no poor people as we understand poverty. So uh, instead of blaming the left for all the economic problems that we have, we've bought, particularly recent times, particularly over the last 10 years, we bought into you know, Donald Trump's line of it's the corporations, it's big business, it's trade, and it's immigrants that are causing the problems of the working class. Again, none of that is true from an economic or political perspective. All right, but, so I think conservatives are betraying the working class in doing that it, rather than liberating the working class. And I like the fact that England went to this, uh, I forget how you described it, but kind of a one payment kind of uh, system rather than labyrinth, that is a huge step forward. Uh, to getting rid of that completely and liberating the working class would be dependent on government. Not that I'm against charity, not that I'm against benevolence towards other people, but I'm against telling them they're so incompetent that money has to be stolen from one class of people and give it to them by force, rather than them depending on their own ability to, to rise up and be successful. I, I believe every human being is capable of doing that. Um, I, I think there's a straw manning, there always is, of, of what it means to be self-interested. Um, the fact that I'm self-interested uh, makes me love people even more because I know their value to me. Other people are massive value to me. And indeed, you, you describe conservatism as the philosophy of love. That is exactly how for years I've uh, described objectivism. Objectivism is the philosophy of love because I love myself. I love anybody contributes to my life. I love workers in China for building my iPhone. <laughs> I, I love the, the, the productive ability of people all over the world. I love the artists of the past, of the present and of the future for enhancing my spiritual life. I love my family, my friends, my, my wife, which is obvious. They're all an extension of me. They become an extension of me. And it starts 
from the value they represent to me. So my love, I believe, is deeper than a love that is selfless. I think Ayn Rand gave this example, but I love it, so I always use it, right? Imagine going up to your wife or, or your wife-to-be or husband-to-be uh, before the wedding and saying to them, you don't, you don't really do anything to me, right? This is completely selfless. I'm marrying you for selfless reasons. This is a selfless love. I mean, they would slap you as they should. No, you want to go to your spouse-to-be and say, you move me. You make me better. You make my life worth living. It's what you do to me, which makes this so valuable to me, this love as great as it is. So, uh, you know, let's not turn self-interest, at least not as Ayn Rand described it. Maybe there's something because well, it is this. I, I, we want to go and live on a desert island somewhere, but be all alone and we hate society. Quite the contrary. I love other people, the good people, the productive people, the, the, the people who, who are trying to make their life a good life and are willing to uh, are willing to, to contribute and to trade uh, with me. So um, the, I think, again, that self-interest properly understood is a, a builder of that kind of community. community. You know, I'm not thinking about what are you trying to get from me? Because it's not a zero-sum world. I'm thinking about how can we benefit each other? How can we spiritually and materially? It's not all about dollars. How, do, how can we make our lives better, right? That to me is true self-interest, and that's um, and it's 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 the selflessness and the pretense often of selflessness because very few people are truly selfless, it, it, which I think corrupts, which destroys. Every authoritarian in history has done it in the name of selflessness. Every leftist, every environmentalist is doing it in the name of selflessness. Uh, the modern liberals are not selfless. Liberals in the American sense, the modern leftists are not are not self-interested. They're selfless. They claim to be selfless. Right, but what they have rejected is reason. They're pure emotionalists, and and uh, and 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 that is what makes them so dangerous. So, um, I think it's important that we have a proper understanding of what selfishness, self-interest, at least, is. Excellent. So, gentlemen, let's move the discussion to another direction. By the way, we have 17 more minutes. So, someone who wants to ask questions now is the time. So, I want to introduce in the discussion the issue of the culture wars. Because it seems to be the field where conservatism today is thriving. Of course, they would say we didn't start the culture wars, but it seems to be the area where particularly the type of conservatives like, for example, Turning Point in the United States. So the most vocal, young and active conservatives are engaged to. And again, on the one hand, you can say we didn't start this and we have to somehow defend the cultural, let's say, onslaught from, from the left. But on the other hand, there's something quite often a bit shallow in the culture world. There's a bit of, uh, we, we're going to do basically what the other side is, is doing. And it becomes a bit, maybe, I don't know, maybe anti-philosophical, anti anti-ideological. So, Darren, I want to ask you, what's your take on the culture wars? Why do you think conservatives today get so invested into it? Is it a sign of, okay, now we're standing up? Or is it a sign maybe of weakness that, well, we haven't got real philosophical or ideological differences from the other side. Therefore, the culture wars is the fertile ground where we can face them. So how do you see this topic? Yeah, Nico, that's a really good question. I, I think ultimately for me, I think there is, as I said earlier, there is an element of the Conservative Party in, uh, currently not having an anchor, not having a philosophical root, not having, it is like, like I described, like a shopping trolley that's veering off with only three wheels. And and actually, your your question is good because it was a question I was I wanted to put to to your own actually when I was thinking about this particular topic because I'd like to know why objectivists in particular seem to spend a disproportionate amount of time sort of punching right at conservatives and missing the left because in my opinion the culture war is the most important battle that we could possibly fight at the moment, because it's about the very heart and soul of, of the, the, the identity of, of our country, of the, the, uh, the core underpinnings of it, the values of it. And yet there, there seems to be a sort of reticence to, to take on the issues of, of cancel culture, the censorious nature of it, the statue toppling, the 
educational brainwashing and much all else from the radical left. And I'll tell you why I think objectivists fail on this point. I think it's because there's this sort of like laissez-faire, let do, you know, the kids will do what kids are going to do, right? These radicals are going to do what they're going to do. And I, I don't actually think that should be right. I think we should all be really alarmed by this because it's not pro-enlightenment. They, you know, most of these people that are pulling down statues and shouting racism at the top of their lungs, screeching it until, I don't know, they begin to froth at the mouth. These people won't know their, their enlightenment from their elbow, frankly, right? So I think th there's got to be more of a pushback against pockets of the radical left, which are powerful throughout our institutions, educational institutions, powerful throughout the, the I hear it time and time again in this country, in some of the most august institutions around the world, Oxford University, Cambridge University, the London School of Economics. I could go on and on where an invitation will be issued for a Conservative Party MP. Bearing in mind, I told you earlier, 14 million people voted Conservative in this country in 2019. An invitation will be issued. The students will secure a venue. Conservative students. Yes, there are some of us, I promise. Students and, and then the speaker will be secured and all the rest of it. And the invitation will have to be rescinded. It'll have to be removed because there have been protests. There have been the, the avenues to speech and debate for, for kids to actually hear conservative sides of the argument removed from them entirely. And this is all happening at breakneck speed. And I'm alarmed that we're not more alarmed by this. Um, so that I guess that's where that's my position on, on cancel culture. Yes, I'm damn well. I'm scared about it because I guess if this goes tits up, you know, we're all in the metaphorical gulags or literal gulags, actually. So uh, I, I don't disagree with any of that with regards to cancel culture or, or, or the, 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 the crazy left. Um, I don't think we don't punch in that direction. We do. We are in a unique position where we feel like we have to punch in all directions because, uh, uh, you know, our, the misinterpretation and, and the, the, the people who we oppose on both sides. But let me just say something about the culture war because I think it's interesting. I think what's happened and, and what's tragic, but maybe was inevitable, was basically conservatives have given up on the economic freedom issue. They've given up. There, there is no, there's almost no energy, passion, excitement on the conservative side about defending economic freedom. Um, and, and you can see them with the Johnson government, but you can see it with Trump and you could see it with with uh, before Trump, every president since Reagan, and even Reagan was a better um, was better at giving a speech than actually governing in terms of in terms of defending economic liberty. Uh, eco basically, the left has won economic the, the issue on economic liberty. There is no economic liberty. So now the debate is: Should we run in the United States? You know, should we do a, 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 a infrastructure that's a tr two trillion or? or, or one trillion and the compromise is 1.2 trillion between conservatives who are going to vote for this and and the left uh during trump uh you know government spending went through the roof through the roof right there was no respect for economic liberty or physical responsibility what we used to be associated with conservatives uh is gone it, it, it's just this weird they basically folded they basically retreated and given up and what's left What's left is to fight over culture wars. Now, some of the culture wars need fighting against. There's no question. Cancel culture, uh, uh, CRT, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the idea that everybody's a racist who disagrees with them is sickening. I, you know, I'm, I, I think the attitude towards uh, statues should be, should be more nuanced. Um, I, I find it offensive uh, to, uh, to have a statue paid for by uh, the state in on state property of Robert E. Lee, who fought for nothing but slavery. Slavery is a, an abomination, and it would be good to take that statue and put it in a museum. I am I'm completely support uh, the, 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 the moving of statues of uh, not of slaveholders, but people who fought for slavery, people who believed in slavery, people who are willing to put their lives down for slavery, not for freedom, not for liberty, for slavery. Um, yeah, I don't think they have a place in the public square assault, assault, uh, statues. So I think the position is a little bit nuanced. Now, of course, the left being moronic as they are, 
and emotionless as they are, then go and topple the statue of Abe Lincoln or topple the statue of, 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 of a Thomas Jefferson, the guy who actually articulated the words that made it possible to ultimately free the slaves. They attacked the Enlightenment, the, that, that, uh, you know, those thinkers who made slavery an abomination in intellectual history. Nobody before them had really done that. Everybody had supported slavery in the history of man, including you know, the major religions. Um, so I, I think the culture was, those the culture was worth fighting. Certain things that the left done are just abomination and need to be fought you know, with everything we have. Um, but at the same time, we disagree about certain things about the culture. You know, I support abortion. Um, you know, I support uh, I supported gay marriage. Uh, conservatives didn't. It, they had to be it had to be overrun. Right. In a sense, the left had to win that one so that even conservatives now have moved in that direction uh, over time. Um, you know, if somebody wants to be transgender, who cares when it comes to sports? Let the sport leagues make a decision. It really, you know, I, I, I think there's a right decision and a wrong decision, but I'm I willing to lay down on that uh, when it comes to English language. All right. I, I, I know that, that some of these things are really upsetting. But on the other hand, we don't speak English the way Shakespeare did. Language changes. Uh, it's going to evolve into the future. It would be nice if it would evolve more slowly, maybe. Than, than, and I think the more important issues around gender have to do with the fact that they want to do away with gender or they want to do away with differences between male and female, that they want to do away with biology that they want to do away with genetics, they want to do a, away with nature and reality and, and facts. That's what worries me. The, the nuances of it, I think, are, are, are less important. So yes, the real cultural issues that we need to fight, but I'm not sure always that by associating with the conservatives on these cultural issues, that I am leading to winning because I'm not sure what winning looks like. Uh, I'll also admit that I think conservatives have basically lost all those battles. If you think about the battles that conservatives really fought over, over uh, homosexuality, uh, they lost that one. Uh, they lost the fight over abortion. They've lost most of the battles. They're not very good. And it goes back to they've lost the economic battle, the economic liberties battle. So if you look at conservatism over the last 100 years, it, ha it doesn't have a very good track record on winning on anything. Uh, they've, you know, they've lost most of the cultural battles and they certainly lost the economic battle. We live in a world now where a mixed economy with a heavy portion of regulation and redistribution of wealth is just accepted as fact, as fiat. Indeed, conservatives today want, you know, tend to be to want to conserve the welfare state. Um, you know, after FDR in the United States, conservatives fought for doing away with Social Security. Today, they want to be they're the biggest saviors of Social Security. When Johnson instituted Medicare and the, and, and the welfare state, conservatives wanted to do away with Medicare and the welfare state. Within 20 years, they were the biggest defenders of, wealth, of, 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 uh, of uh, Medicare and the welfare state. So it, 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 it's hard to get excited about getting involved in a conservative movement that has done nothing to oppose leftist policies over the last hundred years. We are, we are leftist societies in, in for, for good when it comes, for example, to gay rights, for bad when it comes to economic liberty and today the nuttiness, complete and utter nuttiness of CRT and, and the rest of it. Okay, final this question. This is why I said to begin with that I think to a large extent, the state of the world we live in today is to a large extent, I blame the conservatives for it because what did they do to stop it? Nothing. Uh, and indeed, they hastened it, I would argue, uh, because of their weak defense of liberty, their weak defense of economic freedom, and, and, uh, and their weak defense of free speech. I mean, I mean, to have Donald Trump be a defender of free speech is truly a scary proposition. Now, I know he's not a conservative, technically, but many conservatives supported him, but he was, he was not an advocate of free speech. He's not more an advocate for free speech than these nuts on the left. And I'm sorry we had to get to Donald Trump. Why did I go there? Sorry. <laughs> okay, so final question. It's going to be slightly different for both of you. So, Darren, so where do you see conservatives going in terms of what is the, how does conservatives win? So you mentioned, for example, the media. I'm working in the academia, so I can tell you this ship has sailed. There's no, there's no hope there. So the pillars that make the the culture of a society are more and more towards the other direction. Mm -hmm. So how do you see conservatism winning? And then I want to ask Yaron, how do you see conservatism evolving, whether winning or not? Do you see it going more towards the direction that you wouldn't like, or do you think there's any hope that conservatism is gonna 
be closer to the values you mentioned, Yaron? So let's start with Darren. Uh, yeah, again, good question. Uh, I think you're absolutely right as far as the pop culture is concerned, as far as uh, the education system even is concerned. Conservatives are losing across the board. It was actually the main pitch of why I set up my YouTube channel in the first place is because I actually wanted to make these arguments. And the amount of time, somewhat depressingly, and this will be music to some people's ears, I've no doubt, but so many times where even the, the BBC, our state broadcaster, has said to me, oh, well, we're going to have to get you on because we've never had a young conservative before. And you sort of think, well, oh, that's a bit depressing. Um, and so I, I, I fully recognise that many of these arguments are not going to make me the most popular boy at a party and holding up a steady sign won't make me the most fashionable person at a party. But I I think the way the way in which you actually fight back. We've seen this through the, the vote for Brexit. We were told that it would never happen. Poll after poll said it would never happen. And yet there, there seems to have been that this recognition now that there are communities with a, a sh sort of shared sense of, of identity, a shared sense of culture, a shared sense of community that isn't seen on our telly screens. You know, Netflix don't put that in their shows. They've got a rainbow coalition displayed on every program under the sun, but not, I think, the, the sort of diverse mixture of, of communities in this country that still exist and that are still actually pretty damn conservative. You saw that in, in the likes of Australia, for example. Australia, the Liberals were supposed to uh, not be booted out of office. The Labour Party lost that election. The Liberal Party in Australia, of course, being more conservative. And, and I think these are all, that, by the way, was for the climate change targets, because people said, I'm not going to lose my job, thank you very much. And I think time and time again, conservatives are shown that they are still electoral forces around the world. So I'm not too pessimistic about this because conservatism is a nimble beast. You might say, well, that Darren, you're just saying it's, you know, it's translucent, tr opaque. It doesn't stand for anything. It means nothing. It's meaningless. But I don't think that's right. I think actually it always, yes, it harks back to the past, but it's all about that process of change and not change for change's sake. So if we need to change to save the planet, for example, then yeah, let's do that. But let's not put in place sort of arbitrary targets would be, I think, a, a good conservative position. But I don't think we, we should be entirely depressed. I think that the culture war arguments, increasingly, we are winning those arguments. And that's because people are increasingly worried about their culture. They're increasingly worried about what they're seeing happening in their country. So don't count the Conservatives out just yet. Um, I think after more than a decade in power, they're clearly showing that they're doing something right. But yes, it's, I'm not totally at ease with everything they're doing. I would agree with you on that, but um, I'm not totally pessimistic either. I'm on the fence, which I would be, wouldn't I? Yaron. Yeah, yeah, so so I'm um, I'm with Darren here. I'm optimistic for the conservatives. I, I think conservatives. I think America is fundamentally a conservative country. I think I think uh, Europe is. Uh, I think the left is so wacky that the people are going to turn against the left. I don't think the left is a winning ideology. But at the same time, I'm scared. I'm scared of the conservatives' victory because I see more and more conservatives wanting to embrace the tactics of the left to achieve their goal. I see uh, more and more conservatives saying, yeah, I mean, we should censor, right? Uh, the left's so good at this, we should do it. Um, if, if, if they control the media, we should control the media. If they're going to limit speech, we should limit speech. If they're going to give welfare, we should, you know, they're, they're basically mimicking the left. I, I, I fear a world in which the current brand of conservatism wins. Um, I, I think it is a, it is a world uh, that is uh, much more nationalistic um, in, in the negative sense as placing the state above the individual than I would like to see. I think it is a world with no real economic freedom. Uh, you know, again, the last proponents of economic freedom on the right were Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. I, I don't see many, um, uh, many advocates today in the conservative movement advocating for economic freedom. Uh, in, a, in as passionate a voice as they attack the left, uh, uh, you know, they basically 
they've given up on that battle, it seems. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced that conservatives are going to be, at the end of the day, pro-free speech. I'm just not convinced of it. Uh, again, I see too much, too many signs um, that they're quite willing to silence the left uh, when they don't like what the left is going to say. Now, the, the, the power now is on the left, but I don't think that's sustainable. I think, the, I think people are going to reject the left. You know, the, the, the majority of Americans are not going to buy into critical race theory. It's not a viable culture. It, it's, a, it's a culture of destruction. We might go through some massive apocalypse where, 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 where really bad things happen. But at, at the end of the day, people will reject the, the, the far left. It's just too wacky and too insane. Um, just like in the end, the French Revolution was rejected, right? Uh, the guillotine was rejected. But in the name of what replaced it, the conservatism of Napoleon, if you will, and, and, and quite, quite nasty wars that resulted from that. So I worry about the world the conservatives are going to create. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't see any Barry Goldwaters, who is the last conservative I really liked um, out there in terms, of, in terms of a real defense of liberty, a real defense of freedom, uh, a real interest in, um, in individualism and the defense of individualism. I see collectivism on the rise among conservatives. I see statism on the rise, nationalism on the rise. And, um, and look, I just want to say something about Brexit. I know this is, I shouldn't throw it out at the end, but look, look, Brexit is great in one condition. And that is that Brexit is used to move the UK to a position of greater freedom than what the European Union was doing. The European Union is a bureaucratic nightmare of, of regulations and controls. But if the UK adopts all those regulations, adopts all those controls, for example, zero carbon, you know, mythology, right? If it adopts all those things in the name of Britain rather than in the name of the EU, and you're just as unfree as you were before, what value is it? So it's not Brexit in and of itself that I see a value. It's what you do with it. And if what the conservative movement does with it is mimics Europe, then, you know, it, 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 it will all be for naught, which will be a great tragedy because it's a great opportunity for the UK to establish, you know, I'd love to see a free trade island, right? you know, drop tariffs to zero in the UK. That would be a model for the world and it would shake things up and you'd become significantly more richer. And uh, it's a win-win for everybody. And that would be a real revolution and that would justify everything associated with Brexit. But it's not going to happen. We know it's not going to happen. Uh, and conservatives are not going to lead that. I've been so, to the barricades in favor of Brexit and now to import some oil from Crete, which is my oil, like my family sending it, it's stuck in customs for two months and I have to pay them Penalties, God knows why. Anyway, so many thanks to both of our speakers. So Darren, people can, you mentioned Reasoned, which is your YouTube channel. People can also find, so it's Reasoned. If you put Darren Grimes Reasoned, you're going to find it. Darren put social commentary there on uh, current affairs. You can also find him on, on Twitter. Anything else, Darren, where you want to, people to know about you, the things you're doing these days? If you just go to darrengrimes.com, links are all there. So, yeah, thank you very much. And when it comes to Yaron, he's hopefully, if, the, if there's no problem in the borders or something, he's going to be with us this Saturday, 3 o'clock in David Games College. Uh, the topic is the topic of the, the... And that's a live event. No more Zoom. That's a live event. And he's going to be with me and with Inaya Follarin from the Free Speech Union, and we're going to discuss tribalism in politics. So many thanks to Darren, many thanks to Yaron, many thanks to the Ayn Rand Institute for supporting and sponsoring these events. Many thanks to you, the viewers. All the best. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>